everyone, and welcome to another episode of Disclosure in the Media. Uh, I'm here with Ryan Ponkarts again, uh, hey. and we're talking about the Blades this time in the Elder Scrolls lore. So take it away, Ryan. All right. Well, the Blades grew, are a interesting faction. They are basically the Emperor of the Third Empire and the Dragonborn Emperor's bodyguards. Um but their origins lie back at the end of the first era during the Akaviri invasion that would lead to Remen Cyrodiil's ascendancy as emperor of Cyrodiil. So it starts with the Sayesi, which people call them the snake men of Akavir. Now, the lore is so sort of contradictory, and we know for a fact that there are some that are like serpentine humanoids, like serpentine bottom, upper half human. Um or at least upper half humanoid, mm -hmm. most likely still reptilian looking though, as well as there is like a men looking ver group that also falls under the Sayasi. So what we believe is that there, at one point there was a caste system mm -hmm. where these reptilian people were on top and these humans were sort of at the bottom. Mm -hmm. Or maybe like Naga. It was, it's kind of like the Naga in, in East Indian mythology. Yeah. yeah. And uh, we, but it is implied that sometime after this invasion that this human faction became the majority or overthrew the upper castes because by the time of the late third era when uh, Tiber Septim's, one of Tiber Septim's heirs uh, invades Akavir, the mm -hmm. reports that come back, which were fragmented at best, talk about the Sayasi as being um, mounted men. So we know for a fact that at least the only CSE that that Imperial force ran into were of the man type. And being that the fact that the CSE often had these serpent men leading their armies in the past, it's likely that either they are gone or they're in such low numbers now that this other group has kind of taken over or was now the, is still the major group. Mm -hmm. And the only reason I'm saying that is because this could be contrary to what actually comes out later because that invasion was like notoriously disjointed and stuff. Mm -hmm. So the, the information there could be hearsay. Uh, I mean, even the, the emperor that led it died and only like one ship of guys got back. So yeah, um, that's all that we know about them going into the, like the later periods of the Sayasi themselves. This so is interesting because, uh, well, I didn't mean to interrupt, but yeah, this is interesting. Yeah, this is like the types of Naga where you have a, they had a caste system like in India had a caste system as well, and you have like some human-looking ones that are like they're mistaken for Draco sometimes, but sometimes they're like these these uh, I call them Cobra commanders because they sometimes will show snake traits by having a neck fan like a cobra, uh, but most of the time they look humanish and they can change their skin pigment and scales. So usually they're green like the snake guy on the left there, but yeah, there's others. Uh, uh, there's um, half snake, half human looking ones. I believe they were a genetic experiment at one point. I believe the Orions or one of the good groups like the Probosi did something. I'm actually not certain as to how they, they came into creation completely, but they do have a caste system like that. And when we channeled them one time, they did say there were human looking versions of them too. Uh, like the, the snake uh, snake uh, Naga like this, like in India where you see the ones with the big cobra fans and the ones with the multiple heads and like a hydra kind of thing oh that's actually accurate so this is the same those yes he is are the same of those of those okay uh and so we know as i explained in the raymond cyrodiil episode they came down they conquered they fought across morrowind and skyrim raymond cyrodiil held them at one end an army under vivek basically cut them off and when they realized raymond cyrodiil was a dragonborn they pledged themselves to him because the CSE, the, the leader faction of them was the Dragon Guard that were basically hunting dragons. Mm -hmm. And uh, a dragonborn is the ultimate dragon slayer. So they pledged themselves to Raymond Cyrodiil as dragonborn. Um, so Raymond Cyrodiil uses them and this conjoined army of Cyrodiil and Skyrim to create the Second Empire, conquering most of High Rock, Hammerfell, uh, unifying Colovia and Nibine, and parts of Valenwood and Elsevier under his banner, leaving Argonia, Morrowind, and uh, Somerset to their own devices for the most part. Um, 
and he, him and his dynasty ruled for three generations, and the Dragon Guard basically became the guards of the Emperor, his secret agents, sort of a spy network. Basically, they were the, the Emperor's like personal people, which reflects into our own history in sort of the Varangian Guard view of like the Eastern Roman Empire where you have these invaders come down and then get hired by the Emperor because they're more trustworthy than the people around him. Yep. Um, and around this time, uh, the Blades have, were given areas to set up their temples and their strongholds, uh, one of which was Cloud Ruler Temple and Skyhaven Temple, respectively. In the Skyhaven Temple, um, they built the Alduin's Wall, which would record all the history and the prophecy that the Blades had up until that point, which covers the prophecy of the last Dragonborn and the events of Skyrim. And we'll go through this. I'm going to go through this just because it helps. So when Misrule takes place at the eight corners of the world, when the Brass Tower walks, time is reshaped. That refers to the events of the Elder Scrolls II um, Daggerfall. And when the eight corners, uh, when Misrule takes place at the eight corners of the world, refers to Dagger, uh, Elder Scrolls I um, and uh, the eight towers, each having part of the staff of chaos and uh the guy who was man like pretending to be uriel septum jagar uh jagar tharn the brass tower and timing reshaped refers to the dragon break at the end of uh daggerfall mm -hmm. the three blessed fail and the red tower trembles is the events of morrowind when the man gods of morrowind the tribunal fall from favor and basically their ruse comes out and the red tower trembles means that basically the red mountain in Morrowind like starts getting ready to go off. Mm. Uh, when the dragonborn ruler loses his throne and the white tower falls refers to oblivion and Kate, you can even see the oblivion gate at the white gold tower and this part of it. When the snow tower lies sundered kingless and bleeding refers to the Skyrim civil war. And then the world eater wakes and the wheel turns upon the last dragonborn is basically the beginning of the events of Skyrim. Mm -hmm. And you can see it all depicted here. And then these three people in the center are the, the tongues of the past sending all the wind forward in time. And then this is you, this is mostly the events that proceed. Here's the blades pledging themselves to the dragonborn emperors of the um, third empire. And then you have the whole, going into the final battle between Alduin and the Dragonborn. Okay. But this was recorded, like, early uh, late First Era by the Blades in Skyrim. So this is a prophecy that they had already had, they knew was going to happen. and They came there looking for a Dragonborn, expecting it to be sooner than it was. Hmm. That, that, this is interesting, you know, with the, the Blades, not only do they have, like, uh, both a uh, Norse and uh, Antumban type influence there, and that's a, that attributes to how Asgard and Antumba actually traded back and forth. This also goes to one of the Cassiopeian groups, the Mosin, because uh, I found out, aside from the soldiering ones that are out there, we just did a Galactic Interstellar Council episode on this group, though I called them, like, the Witchers, like, like Geralt of Rivia. It's like, uh, it's kind of like that, where this particular group, they have a stronghold, kind of like Kaer Morhen in, uh, in uh, The Witcher, and uh, they uh, they are actually a mix of Mosen and Human and a couple of other groups as well. So uh, basically showing the blades that are multiracial, spanning anybody that wanted to really join them after a while. So this, uh, this actually makes sense. So it's a mixture of all these things. And this group, particular group of Mosen were more monster hunters, like Draco, uh, like rogue dragon hunters, uh, what you'd expect from a knight, essentially. They had a round table, like Arthurian knights and everything, but they weren't dressed like like uh, like Arthur and his knights, they were more like the blades. This is what the, they uh, they reminded me of. They looked like in armor, kind of like that. But they also had kind of a uh, a modern twist on it a little bit, where it was like a black uh, black jumpsuit, but kind of like armor, but with a, a helmet that went straight back. You could tell that there was some Oriental influence and some European influence in their uh, in their armor. Like you could tell the different races traded with each other. So this is what, who this reminds me of, and also the Witcher. They're attributed to like super soldiers, 
where it's a mix between secret space program, super soldiers, and this Mozen group. You have the alterations that were done to children in the secret space program to turn them into to nano enhanced super soldiers or mutated enhanced super soldiers. And you have the other half, which is actually the monster hunters uh, that they hunted the monsters after the conjunction of the spheres. So it's like you have that. So it's all kind of being displayed here with the blades as well. It's just another take on it. Yes. Uh, so around the same time as they're putting up the Alduin's wall, setting up these temples, they're also still hunting dragons that are in hiding in Skyrim and throughout Tamriel. And they kill a lot of dragons and put them in dragon burial mounds, uh, much like some of the ancient Nords did. The Nords did it. The, the dragon cult did it uh, for the Nords early on as a way to still worship these dragons. The Dragon Guard were doing it so that they could record the locations of these mounds, so that when the, when Alduin do, did return and was able to rot, like uh, resurrect them, the the future blades led by a dragonborn could put these dragons out permanently. And be, well, because also something I failed to mention is that the Dragon Guard and the Akaviri were following the dragons there. It's it's highly implied in the lore the dragons originated on Akavir in this culpa, and so they were following the dragons from there, and that Alduin suffered a very grievous defeat there, and fled at a certain point, or got bored of ruling over Akavir, and left there, and that's why the dragons came to Tamriel. Hmm. Okay. So, at the same three generations of the Remen Dynasty Pass, and the Morag Tong assassinates the emperor the uh basically raymond remen cyrodiil's grandson and he was a newly appointed emperor he did not have an heir yet so he did not there was no one to give the throne to who is believed to have been behind the assassination and hired the morag tongue is versa duche one of the snake men mm -hmm. and these snake men have a very long uh lifespan um, so he was the one who led the Akaviri to Tamriel originally. It is believed, or he was high up in that army mm. uh, that pledged themselves to Remen. Now, it is in, he was the potentate, so he was sort of like the second in command of the empire, and he just kind of took over as the new ruler of Tamriel. Mm. It's implied that he was the one that ordered the assassination, though, from the Morag Tong. And the Morag Tong, uh, basically, we haven't talked about them much, but they're very, they're like Morrowind's main Assassin's Guild. They war regularly with the Dark Brotherhood and are known for um, the fact that in Morrowind, at least, their, their assassinations are legal. They have a writ of execution. They'll kill somebody, then they go to the guards with it, and there's no bounty. Mm. Um, okay. so the Akaveri potentate comes in and the again they, they're weird, they, they wear like the samurai armor and they rule the empire like the, the end of this second empire and uh, Versa Duche basically says when the Riemann uh, line dies that the second era has began so now we're in like the beginning of the second era but without a dragonborn emperor, a lot of the dra uh, or dragon of the dragon's blood emperor, the, a lot of the dragon guard disbands. So only really the spy network stays intact, and a few of the guardsmen of Versa Duche himself stay in service. And a lot of them go, and Versa Duche makes the fighters guild for them to work in as mercenaries because a lot of them went straight off to be mercenaries, for becoming kind of problematic for Versa Duche's government, and as a result, he created the Fighters Guild to have, like, legal mercenary, like, contracts instead mm -hmm. of having mercenary armies marauding around. So that's the origin of the Fighters Guild. Meanwhile, the Akaviri Potentate uh, sort of blends their, the, their traditional um, dress with that of Skyrim and Colovia uh, in a way to try to make themselves seem more Tamrielic than they were. So you can see Nordic influence in like this the 
the bottom part of their armor, as well as Cyrodiilic influence just in the sort of the head crest. And even though they're still clearly the influence of the Eastern looking things. And it, they rule over the Empire for about another 400 years until Morag Tong assassins again take out Versidu Shea's heir. So then, over the next few hundred years, uh, the there's various petty emperors, uh, like the Longhouse Emperors and uh, Veronaculars. All of them have a Dragon Guard. None of them are actually Dragon Guard. Mm -hmm. They are an appearance of Dragon Guard wearing armor reminiscent of the old Dragon Guard and the Akaviri Potentate to try to claim legitimacy, even though they didn't have any. Mm -hmm. um, the next time the Blades slash Dragon Guard come into any kind of real anything is when Tiber Septum becomes the king of Cyrodiil. And the dragon guard people who were left out around who all of them went underground during the later years of the second era come out and fully support him as dragonborn and join him as the blades they would become instrumental in tiber septum's eventual um rule and conquest of tamriel because you know, what this is this is interesting though is like the the basically like reptilian royalty essentially that some of them are portraying that but then there are the uh only certain ones are related to it just like with tiber septum where now you have certain people in royalty that have reptilian genes as well and are related to those particular lines like the potente before you know with uh, with him uh i saw him as like a like essentially like a reptilian ruler uh in uh, in this well you could also see um, you know, like Alduin and uh, Parthenix is like Enki and Enlil in the stories as well, because they they're, they're said to have some reptilian traits themselves uh, as well in the mythology. So uh, also with some of them as the reptilian horns and everything. Granted, that was a viral contagion that did that to them. But in this, this was like essentially uh, the uh, the spreading of like the the certain king line, like uh, like in England with the king line, that's reported to have reptilian traits as well. And so uh, it, this is actually very similar. I didn't mean to interrupt, but that seemed very similar to that. that. Yes, uh, it is. So now the Numidium Tiber Septum traded with uh, when he incorporated Morrowind. He get, he let the Donmar keep their slave and gods in order to get most of the Numidium. There were still many missing pieces, however, and the Blades were tasked with tracking down the other pieces, and they found them, and then Tiber Septim was able to activate the Numidium using um, means that we will go into in another video. And the, the Numidium was basically what won him Somerset. So without the Blades having procured these last pieces, there wouldn't have been any real uh, conquest of Somerset. So the Septim Empire never probably would have been that one Tamriel Empire that it became. Okay. Um, going forward, we have the events that come at the close of the Third Era, where we're in the Third Era as soon as Tiber Septim conquers uh, Somerset. As soon as his conquests are done, he declares the Third Era as this era of peace. Um, but so throughout the rest of that entire period, the Blades act as the bodyguards of the Emperor as well as Imperial Intelligence. They are in all walks of life, their agents, uh, though the majority of them are stationed in Cyrodiil. They, they do have agents everywhere, though, uh, basically acting as an Imperial Intelligence Agency and doing what they can to support the emperor in all of his endeavors. So when one of the heirs of Tiber Septum leads an invasion of Akavir, a lot of them go with and die, which weakens the empire significantly going into the last decade, uh, the last century of the third era. But now we get into the events of Morrowind, uh, Daggerfall Morrowind, 
Oblivion, and uh, the Elder Scrolls One Arena. Uh, so the first four Elder Scrolls games. And this is Caius Cassius, I think is his name. And he is the leader of the Morrowin, the Vardenfell chapter of the Blades. So Vardenfell is the big island in the center of Morrowind. And he is the leader of that localized area of the Blades. Not all of Morrowind, but just Vardenfell. We don't know the leader of the Blades for all of Morrowind at this time. Mm. But he, the Nerevereen, who is the hero that you play as in those games is tasked by, uh, by his release papers to go meet Caius, and Caius inducts him into the Blades, because Uriel Septim VII had a vision that this character would be implement, would be instrumental in, like, the coming days. And it's also, there's a great fan theory that says that Martin Septim being a worshipper of Azura, who is the one that created the Nerevarine prophecy originally, is really where it came from, but it's never been confirmed. But basically, the Nerevarine became a member of the Blades, uh, unknowing, like, like not like an actual guard of the Emperor or really Imperial intelligence, but because the Emperor basically was like, yeah, no, this person needs to be part of the Blades. Um, the main character in Elder Scrolls 1 Arena was an Imperial Legion officer or high up within the imperial society who freed the emperor from a false imprisonment and it's kind of implied that chancellor okado that you can meet in oblivion is this character or that this character is now deep within the blades somewhere but it probably is chancellor okado who is never officially a blade but was privy to everything about the Blades because they were the High Chancellor of the Elder Council, which is basically like the body that runs the government if the Emperor is deposed during the Third Empire. As uh, In the second game, the Blades, you join the Blade in Daggerfall, you join the Blades to uh, deal with the spirit of King Lysandus that is hunting da haunting Daggerfall mm -hmm. by night, and uh, the Blades they're they put you on the path to dealing with that part of the main quest line. Um, in Oblivion, they play a much more central role. So in the opening throws of the game, you actually escape the Imperial City prison with the Blades and the Emperor, Euro Septum, before he is assassinated. Everyone knows that famous opening scene to Oblivion, if you've played it, where you go through the sewers and Uriel Septum gets slain. And you're with the blades, uh, and then you have to bring the amulet of kings to Joffrey, this the leader of the blades, the full leader of the blades during the end of the empire. Uh, well, the end of the Septum Dynasty, not the empire fully. Uh, Joffrey then tasks you with, uh, offers you a place in the blades after you get Martin Septum secure Martin Septum's safety, and most of the main quest line is you, the blades, and Martin Septum working to defeat uh, Mayron's Dagon in the end, Martin Septim uses the Amulet of Kings to close shut the doors of Oblivion. Um, going forward now, into the fourth era, because that marks the end of the third era, uh, the Blades sort of fall out. Uh, that Now that the Empire is... For a while, there was the Stormcrown Interregnum, and essentially, it's a period where there is no emperor. Eventually, the Mede dynasty takes over uh, under Titus Mede I. And the Blades, seeing a new emperor that's not a dragonborn, sort of withdraw from this role as the emperor's bodyguard and imperial intelligence. And the Pentenus Oculatus take that role. Now, the Blades do remain waiting for another dragonborn and... In that period, the rise of the Old Mary Dominion happens, and they view that as a great threat to just all of life on Tamriel, but mostly human life. And as at, by this point, the majority of Blades are humans. Don't take this picture as anything special. I'm just showing it because it involves the Blades fighting a, an elf. Oh, okay. Uh, it, clearly, this is an Argonian, but um, majority of Blades are human descent by this point. Um the, the Snake Men are all gone from the Blades numbers by the rise of the Third Era. Um, we do know that there were certain settlements of Blade of 
Dragon Guard people, though, around Tamriel. Like, we know of one that was in elsewhere, like, after the fall of the Raman Empire that had snake men in it, but by the period that we're talking about, there's no snake men left. It's kind of like uh, in uh, the bad guys in uh, Conan the Barbarian, for instance, they're like the snake men, and they still have, they have kind of like the same style, like Thulsa Doom is kind of like dressed like a blade a little bit in this, and the same thing. So they were kind of implying a bit of ancient history in there where they where uh, snake men were involved very heavily in a lot of these different armies and different guards. Also, um, going back to them guarding the emperor of uh, this group of Mosin told me that they also uh, integrated themselves in as guards and castles and such that they can guard against different monsters like vampires and stuff like that that would approach uh, approach like their leaders and sometimes uh, uh, the bad guys would integrate in as like a dark handler for some of these these uh, different uh, leaders also there would be a good side kind of like Merlin and Arthur where they would have a they would have a teacher in there to guide the leader as well so it was both opposing sides so this is also what's re represented there if you think back to Conan the Barbarian the way kind of like how Sol Tulsa Doom was a shape-shifting snake person as well where he was a wizard from the old world but at the same time he was also a warrior as well that could uh, that was essentially a snake a snake person so they're integrating that bit of galactic history and early earth history in into that where they had them be around also in the times of atlantis and the conan lore but also here where you see them thin out over a period of time and it was mostly humans that were in the blades so they're they're showing a bit of history there the mozen was saying they at one time in history before they were even called that had different people in their ranks that were of different races cat people lizard people uh good lizard people anyway um uh, there are ones out there but i if people focus on the draco so much that uh they don't see that there's good ones out there also uh the other race that looked like the naga a lot of these were incorporated into the old uh, pre-flood uh worlds in the, in this way but then by the time you reach the fourth era there in in uh in elder scrolls you're seeing mostly humans in the in these roles and that's actually accurate like uh the old age uh basically giving into the giving over to the new age of men kind of like in um uh lord of the rings where the age of elves go over to the age of men it's kind of like a, a weird version of that but a more multiracial version of, of that actually yeah it is yeah um and so at this point the blades sort of start a proxy war mm -hmm. and rejoin the empire in a more significant stance. Um, though they don't retain, become like the emperor's bodyguard anymore. Uh, they still, they're, they're just more like they rejoin the empire in a more official stance, but they're not the emperor's bodyguards, but they, they, they work with the penitentist oculatus almost on equal ground where they're still Imperial intelligence and they're fighting like a proxy war for the emperor empire at that point and what happens next is the blades actually do a good number on the the, the old mary dominion that is growing under the thalmor and what happens is finally the thalmor are ready to make their move so they send the demands that they want basically it's the white gold concordant with a few less of the territorial well no with more territorial concessions uh, so it's the it's give us parts of Hammerfell, no more Talos worship. The Blades stuff was in there, but it wasn't as prominent. Like the outlawing of the Blades wasn't in there. They just wanted to know who was a Blade, I believe. The Emperor, of course, was like, no. Uh, so the Great War begins. At the same time, the Thalmor leadership with this demand sends the heads of every Blades agent from the Somerset Isles. So they already knew who all of them in the Somerset Isles were, killed them, decapitated them, and sent the heads with these demands. The war happens. We all know what happens. It ends with the White Gold Concordat that outlaws the Blades and would then go on to uh, also outlaw the worship of Tal Talos, um, High Rock, and Ham... Hammerfell sort of go into limbo for a bit. Hammerfell leaves the Empire to continue their war with the Dominion because Hammerfell had some territorial concessions that the Red Guards could not accept. Uh, so they go in to continue to fight 
the Dominion and have done very well for themselves in that role. Um, and that the Blades becoming outlawed meant that a lot of their members that weren't caught outright were went into hiding. This is Full Thyme, a character in Skyrim that you can meet who is clearly a hidden blade. He wears the Akaviri Blades katana. He's at an inn in the countryside. And the way you can really tell that he's in a, a hidden blade is he doesn't really interact with the main character uh, at all unless you wear and just tells you to get lost unless you wear Thalmor robes. If you wear the Thalmor like wizard robes into the bar, he will think that you're a Thalmor assassin that has finally caught up with him and will attack you outright. And that's how full time we know that is like a hidden blade. And you also meet Esbern and uh, Delphine, who, under the guidance of the last Dragonborn, will rebuild the blades into the dragon hunting organization and help the last Dragonborn fulfill the prophecy on Alduin's wall. And that is the most recent things as of Skyrim that have to do with the blades. I mean, the blade, you can also choose not to rebuild the blades based on the main story of the game if you side with Parthenax, because Delphine wants you to kill off Parthenax after a certain point, but there's a lot of mods if you're on PC. Or I, and I think Xbox also has the mod where you can basically tell her to screw off and you're the Dragonborn and you'll do what you want. Hmm. And uh, then Parthenax can stay alive and you can still do the blades questline stuff. Um... Going forward, Bethesda will probably side with the Blades in that matter, even though Parthenax is a fan-favorite character, just because it's a faction over one character. Mm-hmm. Um, though they might just come right out and say it, that the Dragonborn bitch slapped her and told her, fuck off. And well, yeah, yeah that's, how, that's what they should essentially do, keep both sides uh, uh, to where even Parthenax might assist them from time to time, you know, uh, yeah. actually help them in some way. It's interesting where they have the guy hidden because also they do this with the Star Wars lore a lot too, where with the Jedi, uh, after the Purge, uh, the remaining ones are hiding from Vader and the rest of them. So it's kind of similar. It's like in, in now in modern day where you have some people, the old guard that are try, uh, trying to hide from like the current Orion factions and also uh, their government puppets and the political nonsense and everything that's going on now. So it kind of reflects that where it trickles down to some of the political stuff like the uh, like White Gold Concordat, uh, outlawing a Talos worship, all this other stuff. It kind of reflects a lot of what's going on today. Like I said in the Skyrim episode, people can refer back to that. But uh, but and it's course, also hmm? it's also a mirroring of what they did to the dragons in the ancient past. Yes, exactly. Yeah, basically, uh, essentially, they got back what they did to essentially the dragons. Even though there were evil dragons under Alduin, it doesn't mean all of them are bad. So uh, uh, they want to essentially eliminate all of the threat. Uh, and you can also see them, like I said, a set of super soldiers that just want to be a response team as well. Uh, like a set of super soldiers wanting to get rid of, uh, of anything threat to human populations and uh, uh, you know, men populations. So I can actually, I can actually see uh, why uh, why Bethesda also would choose to go again, go with the organization of the guild versus the individual. But they can appease both sides of that by uh, by having Parthenix still alive, and the Dragonborn, like you said, just bitch slaps Delphine and says, "Screw this! We're going to we're going to keep him alive, and we're getting the organization going again." So I could see that being the canon, but I have this funny feeling they're just going to go strictly with the blades. But uh, the, they might change their mind. They might have a mod somewhere in there too. But uh, but yeah, it makes sense that they would go with the blades, even though Parthenix is a fan favorite character. I I could never do. I could never. Uh, Go by and kill him. I know it's just a character, but I'm thinking, oh, no, we can't do this. I never really tried it. So uh, uh, I'll have to go back and try that out and uh, and see uh, and see what, what happens. I know then you start to fulfill the prophecy of the Dragonborn with the Blades. But uh, but I find Honestly, that super interesting. Yeah. The only difference is, is you get to recruit some people and you get blessings once in a while if you go to the Blades hideout. And um, the... Oh, and... Uh, as Burn will t- basically tell you the stuff that the like you know how the um the the graybeards would tell you where like the dragon walls were so you could learn more shouts. Mm-hmm. He As Burn will do that instead. Oh, okay, yeah. I kind of figured they would have to have another another person telling you where that would be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it's kind of it's it just kind of he takes on that role and then you get to recruit blades agents basically. 
So you can turn followers into blades. Okay. Okay. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, building the organization back up again. So yeah, that that actually makes a lot of sense. So <clears throat> I think we're at the point in the show where somebody could come through and talk about this. I think it's just going to be Isaac again because he's the only one yakking at me at the moment. So it's like, uh, um, yeah, it it helps having like an edifice made because uh, uh, because he can speak through this and then he can arc over to. This guy here that I have sitting, anybody can use this one that I have sitting next to me. And then I have my large crystal here. <clears throat> Man, there's a, there's a, the energy is kind of rocky today, but it's also, there's this stillness, but there's this kind of undulating like current going around here today. So uh, uh, I know the solar activity has been up lately. If people are feeling that from the time of this recording, it's 9, 5, 22 when we recorded this. So, uh, so uh, Isaac, uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take that off. I sometimes have to take the hat off because sometimes the barrier I put up can interfere with the channel sometimes. So, uh, uh, not always, but sometimes it depends on the being, but, uh, um, uh, I'll continue on from here. Okay. Uh, Isaac. <clears throat> it, ooh, there's like this, there's been this weird energy here. I, sw I swear I sensed a dragon around when we were, when we were talking about it. It was like, uh, usually they, 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 they encompass such a large area that uh, you don't always uh, completely see them. They're so big if they blended in with an area or something like that. But I'm leery of dragons because they can kind of go either way when it, uh, when it comes, to, uh, comes to what they feel human sovereignty is. And on the same side, they sometimes can get corrupted by the Orions fairly easy. So, uh, uh, so uh, if there is one around, no offense to that being, I would prefer not to channel that being. So uh, no offense to whomever I'm sensing. But uh, uh, Isaac, yeah, you're more than welcome. Uh, is there a dragon present, Isaac? Just one that's listening. Okay, I thought I sensed a dragon in energy. Okay. Uh, they can be very fickle at times, too. So, uh, uh, okay. Which end? Hmm? Which end is it on? Uh, what do you mean, which end? Like, which end of our transmission is it on? Over here. Okay. On my On my end, but I think it came from yours. So, uh, I think, I shouldn't say it. He... She, oh, excuse me. Okay, all uh, right. Uh, uh, no offense, but yeah, it looks like a medieval, well, like medieval fantasy type dragon you'd expect with the large wings and everything. Mm. Uh, no offense, friend, but I'm very leery of channeling dragons. You guys have not treated us quite right in the past, so I would appreciate it if you would just hold fast, please. All right. Thank you. Appreciate it. I know you're miffed, but I'm sorry. Okay. I'm just leery of I'm leery of them. So uh, they can be cool. They can be great protectors. They're awesome, awesome race of bees. But they also have been known to corrupt very easily. So and get na uh, nanotech in their eyes and stuff like that. They get infected with nanotech and all this other stuff. So, um, uh, so I'm sorry. So Isaac, uh, I would prefer you. All right. All right. Yeah. Yes, I know it's all right. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, large. It was a large dragon. I saw this large head, large yellow, like uh, greeny yellow eyes uh, on the front. Very pretty dragon, like this, um, like brownish, like burnt, like sienna, like color, tannish, burnt, burnt sienna color, yellowy, but with like like these fluorescent, like rainbow scales up along here and everything. Had a little bit of hair too. So, uh, uh, what's your name, friend? I'll I'll just at least give that. Um, did you say your name was Doroth? Doroth? Doroth. Draleth. Draleth. That is your name. Draleth. All right. But no offense. But if you want to give a couple messages, you can speak them directly to me. You're here as an observer only. Okay. Thank you, Draleth. Okay. Draleth. Oh, there's a, hy there's a hyphen or a, uh, uh, at the end of Draleth. Dreleth door, did you say her name was? Dreleth door. Dreleth door. Okay. And you came from, from Ireland where he is right now. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Dreleth. Okay. Uh, okay. Isaac? <clears throat> Observer? Okay. Um, I'm not trying to be skeptical or rude, but I think you understand. Okay. All right. 
just literally of reptilian life forms in general sometimes after the Draco kind of beat us up a lot. So, all right. Uh, all right. Isaac? Whew. Yes, yes, indeed. This is uh, this is an interesting topic. He is correct in his assessment about uh, about the Mosen group that he recently spoke to. Uh, that and uh, the hybridization between the Ontumban and uh, as guardian armor types, as well as sl uh, slight other emergences of other cultures that were also became part of some of those guards in the old uh, past, the old guard in the past, you see. Uh, this particular Mosen group, he likes to call them the Witchers based on Garb of Rivia, but there are also non, a couple non-humans among them. Uh, per their admission in the previous uh, recordings. Um, it's actually quite an interesting tie also to Blades being a response team. You see, in Europe, this particular Mosen group trained other humans, the same as you see the emergence of the Blades training other followers. This is exactly what took place in history following the Hundred Years' War. Uh, you saw other... Uh, other humans being integrated as essentially monster hunters and vampire hunters. This is why you saw different things like vampire hunting kits and such appearing in history. Uh, even though some people were just plain afraid of them. So there were also, even today, this particular response team exists. Uh, they are indeed out there, this Mosen group and the human uh, monster hunter group that's associated with them. They, have, they existed, again, within the Middle Ages and the times of the Hundred Years War. This, uh, this is actually quite fascinating. They're linked to the Blades because, again, they have guarded different emperors and different, uh, uh, different uh, principalities and different kingdoms uh, throughout history. So there is a bit of a historical reference here, and it's slightly different. Uh, the armor for them also could change depending on what kingdom they are guarding. They're not always recognized as the group. They like to be incognito most of the time. Uh, essentially not underground. They're out in the open. They do walk amongst you assessing certain situations, uh, both the human and Mosin group that are there. But they do uh, they do track certain monsters very much like Geralt of Rivia tracks monsters for hire from villages to see if people have been abducted, to see if people have been killed or have been involved in ill rituals and the like, or if portal activity exists such and the such. This is exactly what was being depicted with that. So I can go into questions if you want. Okay, Isaac. Hello again and welcome, as always. Um, as we talk about this topic, uh, it strikes me very interesting that this faction that was on top for so long, so close to the Emperor, basically did like a mere flip in only like 200 years and now went to, from what they went as the hunters to the hunted. And it's, can you speak to factions throughout galactic history that have gone through that same, they were once the very pinnacle of the greatest factions around and then they went to being like a hunted faction because we've seen it now in multiple different pieces of media in star wars it happened with the jedi and with the blades it's happened and now uh and i have a feeling that it's happened a lot out there and i would mm -hmm. love to hear your take on that Yes, this is actually his uh, accurate historical event from what, what you call the Jedi Purge in the Star Wars lore. This is an exact historical event that did take place with not only uh, some of the followers of Odin, but also some of the followers of some of the Mayan Pleiadian groups and other elven groups that became ostracized. And they had to hide amongst the people, uh, very much like in the show Obi-Wan Kenobi, you see him hiding out in the deserts of Tatooine and other Jedi that hide are in incognito but every now and again like one of the jedi in uh obi-wan kenobi the series uh, came out in the open and left a pattern for the inquisitors to find unfortunately this has also happened uh this didn't just attribute to the mosin groups or the human monster hunters but this also applied to any group 
that opposed uh, Orion rule and any of their patterning. This is also why the expansion position took place to begin with. It was some of these groups rooting out some of uh, these of these other good groups that were in hiding. This is why Merlin stayed in hiding to try to teach children, say, the ways of the Force, so to speak, very much like a Jedi in hiding attempting to train uh, train a young Padawan uh, after the, uh, the takeover with Vader and the Emperor and the Empire. So this is what is being depicted. It is a multitude of people also. Anybody that is, say, force sensitive or psionically sensitive, like you both, uh, this uh, this is why there is such targeting on people that are either descended of certain lineages or have certain psychic and psychic abilities. But this is why the force sensitive children were hunted by Vader in your Obi Wan Kenobi series. This was a depicting actual events. They did not want anyone that could oppose them. So any order like the blades that existed were hunted. This is also why the Lyrans were hunted because they helped humankind. This is why the forest people are hunted by the Cabal and military because they don't want these alliances coming back into fruition. You're also seeing also the ends of the fall of Atlantis. This is where uh, the story of the Tower of Babel originated. When uh, the Orions invaded, it broke up all of the known languages and began to create new ones. No one could understand each other because of all the fighting and the opulence that took place leading up to that stage. Even though those energies were invited across the void with the women of Atlantis and the science, science technological areas as well, with the artificial intelligence, this is where you get the enforcers of Atlantis, you see, with the with the uh, uh, AI transhumanistic moves that are being mirrored even now. Uh, this uh, the, uh, the, was the languages that were broken up so no one could understand each other. This was the direct origin of the Tower of Babel, uh, where uh, they were attempt they were so uh, wanting to communicate with the gods, they opened the bridge for the Orions to invade. This story was so old, it just got regurgitated into your Bible. Uh, the same goes with Noah's Ark and the Great Flood. It was the same time frame. Uh, and it, it was based on a Sumerian king and not a white biblical king, as the Bible would have you believe. This is, uh, this is all telling the same history, very much like your devil's tower and the native myth of the bear crawling up the tower. This is where the predators of the world, uh, such as your Orions and their henchmen, the Draco, were attempting to uh, capture uh, those of the Mayan Federation and different Pleiadian groups, very much like your seven sisters and the hunter Orion in Greek mythology. It's the same story. This is essentially those that have been hunted by, by the Orions and their inquisitors and eventually morphing into the church, Spanish Inquisition. They wanted humans help and their human servants, like what happened during the Tuatha Fomorian Wars back in Ireland, where you are now, Ryan. There, this was a big war area between Tuatha de Danana and the Fomorian Orions and human servants on either side. Okay. That's very interesting. Um We've talked a bit about the Naga and their role today, as well as the Sayasi snake men. Um, I know that Chris has talked about them in the past, but for th some newer listeners, would you like to explain a bit of them to people? Yes, they may not want to admit this, but they were essentially a science experiment. Uh, this may piss them off greatly to understand this. They would see themselves as an independent race, which they are, like many the Frobosi created back on Atlantis. Uh, the, they are no different. They are a culmination of different groups experimenting a little bit with hybridization. They eventually, the Orion got to hold of them and uh, actually began to experiment even more. They did this with spider races and horse-like races as well. Uh, this is where your myth of Poseidon creating the unicorn uh, came from. The Frobosi had created uh, a race called the Alarum, which are the original unicorns. And Poseidon took that genome and turned it into what you know as the horse with the horn, uh, essentially hair. But in this, the Naga, uh, are their own sovereign race. They claim to have come from the stars. And this is true. Uh, elements of them did come from the star, but they were genetically engineered once they got here by beings such as the Probosi and different Orion factions. Uh, they do have the body of a snake and the upper body of a man or a woman. They are usually ruled by a female ruler, 
a queen. And there are multiple factions of them around the world, just not in India, where they are famous. Just like you have the Jinn being famous for the Arab world, you have the Naga being famous for the East Indian worlds, but they actually inhabit every continent on the planet. They have clusters of, uh, of, uh, of snake uh, cults around the planet as well, where some of them, like the like Thulsa Doom in uh, Conan the Barbarian, where he was, uh, he created snake cults and snake orgies. That's essentially like the secret space program, satanic cults, and uh, essentially the sexual circle cults of which the author of that unfortunately experienced. But uh, your Robert E. Howard and the like, and others that were disclosing this. But in the ancient past, uh, these uh, these would go on with some of these snake cults or these snake leaders. Now, not all the Naga cults have a female leader. Most of them do. But the ones that are males would be more like Thulsa Doom, where they would morph and shapeshift between two legs and a snake. The females would have a snake full body. Uh, it was rare that they had a male, just like in your Legend of Zelda mythology, where you had the Gerudos that were all females, and one would be a male. This time, it's more like rulers, where it was rare they had a male ruler. This is uh, where some of these, these cults went. Now, the difference between the ones with the snake body and the full form is uh, the genome did evolve slightly differently, and there was some genetic engineering to make it to where they could shift back and forth. Mermaids are the same way, you see, where they can shift to legs from a tail. There was some genetic engineering that happened there. The Myrmidon and the mermaids don't always see eye to eye with that bit of history. They think they naturally evolved that way or mutated after the nuclear blast of Atlantis, very similar to the movie Aquaman. But it is what it is. There was some tampering involved on their end as well. Uh, and there was some nuclear mutation as well because of the blast. So both sides are kind of right. But this, uh, but this with the Naga uh, did a two-legged form take try to take over the snake body form? Yes, it did. That is a real bit of history. They were the servants of the larger snake cult types. And eventually they did take over as the dominant. And this is how that sits even today. So yes, that is a true bit of history. And they are in also in China and Japan as well. This is why they are depicted in those areas as well. This is why you saw them wearing almost like a Japanese looking uh, armor in that picture that you had, because uh, that would be accurate to the Japanese history. The Untumans were quite aware of them as well. They steered clear of them, but the native Japanese eventually saw and revered them very much like your Chinese and Japanese revered dragons. Like our friend that's here today, that's slightly butthurt that she didn't get to uh, speak, but she became an observer and understands his trepidations towards more of the uh, lizard folk, let's say. Okay. Um, with most of the other questions dealt with, how often do races sort of do that 180 flip? that we saw the Sayasi do in the Elder Scrolls, where they came in as this invader, found out something, and then switched sides almost immediately. This is actually interesting. This happens more often than not in history, where they will, uh, say, find a bit of, of history about something and then turn on their original progenitors, or original cap or captors in cases, and in some cases, the invaded become the invaders and vice versa. Like your Knights Templar, for instance, they turned on the church, did they not? Uh, this is a, essentially they found out the lies surrounding this. They wanted to be the keepers of the true histories. This is how that flipped. But the reversal of that, the role reversal of this also has happened where the uh, periods in history where indeed uh, a, an invader will then flip around and become the invaded. It's interestingly enough, he himself saw a Star Trek Discovery episode yesterday about this exact concept where uh, two elemental groups who had a role reversal where one was afraid to let the other one evolve because at one point they were the invader. This pendulum swings back and forth in history quite often uh, more than people realize uh, where someone takes over a position and becomes exactly like the person uh, before them. Uh, essentially taking up the same role. This is essentially uh, Orion influence and other outside, uh, no offense to our, our 
person here, uh, reptilian uh, benefactors as well, where you will you will see a role reversal, or that you will see someone of a certain bloodline that was once a pauper but now is a king. Uh, the uh, the uh, this is uh, the uh, bloodline wars, as he likes to call them, that took place back in the Middle Ages around the time of your Robin Hood and your King John, uh, whereas. Uh, your King John ended up being sterile. So he actually stole Henry III from another family that had a certain trait. This would be more like what you would call your dragonborn trait uh, that uh, was also needed. His handler or his advisor, uh, William, was actually uh, uh, at the behest of more, uh, let's just say, uh, controlling sorts such as Orion and other wizard sorts that were out there. Uh, so this is a, this is a uh, interesting bit of history. You see this role reversal where it also applies to different ET groups wanting to, as you know, the hedge bets of the gods, whereas different armies were controlled to take over different areas. Some groups will bet with each other as if it was a big chessboard or game. Hence, you've seen in your movies, hence you've seen uh, in your TV shows and in your mythology where they would just roll the dice and see which bloodline would do best. So this is also the, one of the main reasons you see that role reversal quite often. Okay. Thank you for your time, Isaac. That's all my questions for today. Yes, thank you. Always a pleasure to be here. Oh, yeah, that was kind of shaky there for a moment. Uh, it was kind of this kind of like that a little bit it's been that way because of the solar activity it's been quite prolific lately but uh yeah oh it's really dizzying too i'm just it's kind of like this weird weird vibe that's in there the energy is kind of purple and blue in here and it's kind of just undulating around uh our, our dragon friend might be doing this uh too but uh i uh for her presence i can actually feel kind of a heat around my face and everything from from her uh they are an elemental species so uh, she, uh, so they can also affect the human genome sometimes. I ran into another elemental by the name of uh, Chura that also affected my blood pressure, unbeknownst to her. She apologized for it, but it was her energetic makeup. The, the, the reference they were making, it's in season two of Star Trek Discovery, where the, the, one of the main characters, he's a Kelpian. Uh, his name is Suru. He's an elemental but he's a commander of the ship. He's a first officer. And uh, they go back to his homeworld. Uh, at one point, and they're protected by the by the uh, by the prime directive or order number one. He can't interfere with uh, with that culture because they're a primitive culture. He just happened to find out the knowledge of the Federation and aliens and everything, and he went volunteered to go with uh, with a Federation officer at the time. Uh, but uh, but he was told never to return to his home to pollute their belief system or something. Uh -huh. But he found out something different when there was another elemental group that was oppressing his people. And basically calling them down constantly and lying to them about their evolutionary right, uh, evolutionary uh, uh, traits and everything. So he came back, assisted them, and uh, the uh, the uh, discovery of Cap uh, Captain Pike of Discovery had to help rebalance and renegotiate things with the other elemental group that was there. That were kind of like forest elementals. They were kind of like covered in like black goo, but they were had this long dreadlocks and everything. They couldn't exist out outside of their pools for a while. But they were highly technologically advanced. They were pointing pointing at the Orion oppression with the black goo a little bit, but also they were basically saying sometimes some elemental groups aren't always always nice. And they were pointing this group would point fingers at the uh, at the Kelpians saying they oppressed us once, uh, so we were trying to prevent them from doing this again. But it still pointed at the for and against role reversal all the time in that show, which I found fascinating. And that's what that's the that's the context by what. That Isaac was talking about was uh, if people want to see this, it's Star Trek Discovery season two. It's actually in, in, that's a story arc they had going on in that in part of that season. So uh, it's like kind of very fascinating that 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 we saw that synchronicity yesterday with a couple of episodes that touched on that, and now it's being mentioned with the Elder Scrolls with the role reverses. Uh, so uh, and the oppressive oppression on some groups that had do dominance and control or prominence at some point. So I find that interesting that ties together with that. But that was just that just proves that was a synchronicity. So um yeah, that then that proves that's happened through history. So uh I don't know if you have anything else to add, uh, Ryan, before we take this out. No, that's that's it for me today. 
Well, all right. Uh, yeah, thank you everybody for watching this episode. It was actually quite a fascinating one. And I didn't even realize that Star Trek synchronicity was one until now this was mentioned today. So uh, uh, that was a kind of a synchronicity being you know, seen or actualized in the making there. So uh, thank you everybody for watching this episode. Hope you enjoyed this. Uh, 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 take care, everybody. Bye-bye now. See ya. I'm going to put into context some of the things you heard me talk about about dragons. Um, you know, uh, before the, the, the call, Ryan, I uh, yes, uh, I found out there was this elemental force that was around him, and I couldn't see it. It was so large. Uh, this was a large dragon. You heard Drayleth door. Well, uh, she wanted to speak, speak on the show, and you saw me, you know, hesitate big time. What happened, the last uh, dragons that we dealt with, they corrupt very easily. And they get hit with the AI so quickly in more city areas. I know that was around him. She was around him in Dublin. But um, uh, the last one we dealt with was Plutus. And he corrupted so badly. He got hit with AI so badly. Uh, and they hit, get hit with that uh, one that's in the eye. Uh, that's probably why my eyes were screwing up a little bit but uh, during the show. But there's like this little glowing orb that goes in the eye. And Plutus had this. He started to look like the Terminator after a while. It assimilated part of his mind. And they go after dragons. They're targeted. Kazatzul are targeted. Lyrans are targeted. Sasquatch are targeted. Um, also, anything dragon related. Lion beings, you know. Uh, Kazatzul was dragon cat. Then you had, uh, they were from space. And you have the original primal ones that were from here. Uh, like the medieval fantasy looking ones. The uh, cat like ones that you see in Oriental myth and legend. Those are more Kazatzul. And uh, uh, with the cat uh, mix, and that was the, the lineage that created uh, the Lyran descendant, descendant lineage after a while. So, uh, and we're part of that as well, with more of that lineage that comes out, some of that royal lineage. Some of it is dragon that comes out, some of it is the reptilian Draco oppressive garbage too that's out there as well. And you heard me compare some of this. But what happened? Now it's a loud locust. Okay. What happened? Uh, uh, was uh, you also had Relento and Lenthazar years ago as well. They got attacked and corrupted. We don't know how true some of their story was. We don't know how much of it was a lie. That's another area we need to vet, revet. And Dreyleth Door is no different. And there was another dragon I encountered in Ireland in uh, a session some months back as well that I had to have, give the same thing, say the same thing to Placar, Plac Placar. I think his name was, but Placar Greth or something like that. I can't remember the name, but uh, Placar Greth. Okay, uh, I believe it was, it was the name. But uh, he was a yellowy-looking dragon. She is. Uh, she was like a like a uh, burnt sienna tone with like the tones that are out here, like the dirt. Thank you. Camouflage is what I'm being told. Okay, but I. Uh, She's a little butthurt, but I keep telling her to go home because uh, um, I don't want the same thing to happen. It's out of safety for them as well. And so, yeah, I, ha uh, I have to be leery of dragons, even though I have dragon imagery all the place. And we talk about the dragonborn and all this. But you would think I'd be all right. No. Uh, Relento and Lentazar, they, they got hurt during a conflict. They, they turned. Plutus was the last one we had. He turned horribly. He oppressed us very, very horribly. And it took the, uh, an army of forest people to get rid of him. Uh, it was uh, basically they, get, they become almost as powerful as an archdemon or hyper Draco, one of those large interdimensional ones. So, yeah, I, I uh, well, I, I, uh, I just have tre great trepidations behind it. I wanted to give context because we've had so many turn that it's just not worth it for them and not worth it for us. So. Uh, yeah, I have a feeling we have a friend here, though, uh, that uh, we're going to have to do something about. But uh, no insult intended. But they're not, uh, they're, they're, they have uh, they're basically different ideas of what human sovereignty is, such as uh, getting, uh, uh, how can I put this? Uh, like, uh, they, they could overprotect to the point where. Uh, uh, they say it's for 
human good or sovereignty when it's in fact a conflicting agenda. It could be benevolence, but with a conflicting agenda and not an aligned one. Like you always see, uh, you'll hear me say compatible agendas. So, uh, or non-conflicting agendas. Uh, you get, uh, so you, that's why you always hear me say that. They sometimes have conflicting ones. And it could be what they consider to be benevolence, but we see it as more oppressive. So uh, that there, it's uh, it could uh, it it goes into an area that makes me very nervous, as you can tell. So uh, so yeah, drill the door. I I need you to remove yourself for uh, a time until we can reassess, please. Thank you. We'll see if she has actually left later, but I'll give more information on this as I get more. So uh, it is. Oh, I'm just going to say be leery, very leery. Um, it is 12.51 p.m., Monday, September 5th, 2022. Thank you. Okay, something to add to uh, the uh, Blades conversation. This saw on Ancient Aliens images of, you know, the, the seraphim and also uh, Naga-like images. They showed a guy with a snake bottom. And you heard me mentioning the Naga, but the Seraphim, I didn't, I guess, touch on, you know, giant serpents. Those are the ones I mentioned in the um, Princes of the Universe episode, the Conquistadors of Time and Space, or the, uh, or the uh, giant serpent, you know, effeminate pretty boy types, angel types. Uh, or, you know, like I said, Seraphim, Giant Serpent. That's what was mentioned as the foot soldiers in this that had more of the human feet. And one was like the reptile snake body. They were meant, they were touching on that. Not loosely either, they were directly touching on it. Uh, it's that they didn't, they just showed, they didn't show any with wings. So, or the uh, Orion Nordic types with the, uh, with the feminine features in the wings. They didn't touch on that. But I find it interesting that they uh, touched on it in uh, in Ancient Aliens uh, tonight. We just happen to be seeing that same subject, and it keeps continuing ever since we did the Princes of the Universe episode. It's just this this uh, freight train of information. Even though we thought we knew enough about the this particular Orion sect, uh, this information just keeps on coming. Just keeps on coming. So I'll add this to the end of the Blades conversation. Uh, I find that very interesting that also the makers of Elder Scrolls, Bethesda, decided to put this in there. And again, it was directly referenced, not loosely referenced. So they just didn't have the wings. So I'll put that here. It is 9.28 p.m. Friday, September 9th, 2022. Thank you. Okay, we went to a lecture today. I'll add this to the Blades conversation because there's no more room on the Princes of the Universe one. Mm. We went to a lecture today, whereas the person that was giving it was being horribly attacked in the hip, her hip. And one snake after another I pulled out of there. Uh, one etheric snake, that is, it'd be a little weird if they were actual ones, but... Uh, the uh, I kept pulling it out, pulling it out, pulling it out, and something kept putting it back. And uh, then I traced it to this acupuncturist she had gone to. There had been a demon around him, like this henchman, one of those, uh, I call them agents of chaos. There's berserker kinds that are much larger. This one was more of a black and red and orange colored one. You could say it was a berserker kind too, but this one was shorter. It was more like a devil kind. Had like lumpy scales having been in lava tubes or something like that. Like any Draco got rid of it. Uh, traced it back to an Orion vessel that was hiding in the stratosphere. Maybe eight or ten Nordics. And uh, got rid of that. A black hole that got rid of that. Well, this, this was... Uh, Interesting, not, well, I shouldn't say interesting, but this, this falls right in line with that reptilian group that was mentioned in the recording, and also the group that was in the uh, Princes of the Universe uh, episode we did of GIC Infinitum. 
also. This falls in line with something my mother ran into all her life when she was a teenager. She had this Fabio-like um, being come to her. But we found out his name was Jesker. And he was actually a Draco reptilian, blue-colored, really bald-looking, you know, uh, bald, well, sometimes bald, sometimes he had long black hair. Um, and I ran into the one, uh, another one, I cannot remember her name, per se, it's probably not important. Um, and she had a child she claimed was a hybrid between a reptilian and myself, which I'm doubting this at this point in time. And these were Draco, flat-faced Draco, and he had, like, bluish, blackish scales. Uh, Joanna had one around her by the name of Narnuth. But these guys had the ability to show themselves as, like, a, um, a blonde-haired, blue-eyed with slight scales like these Nordic Orions. And some people are, are basically stating that they're always coming to them as, like, this Fabio-type figure. No denigration to Fabio if you're hearing this. I'm just saying they use your features if you're hearing this. Uh, so I probably shouldn't say that. I should probably say Nordic features. Anyway, uh, I'm beginning to wonder if it wasn't the reverse around, you know, not necessarily shape-shifting. I suppose shape-shifting too, but if they weren't just these, these, uh, Scandinavian-looking Nordic guys from Aldebaran, and the reptilian was more of a guys, or the vice versa, or they had the ability to shift. Some people, some of them can go back and forth, but... This uh, Nordic Orion, Aldebaran Orion group, uh, again, it looks like those Pleiadians you always see people channel. Again, not denigrating the actual good Pleiadian groups, like the ones that uh, Barbara Marciniak channeled, and also Bringers of the Dawn, all these others. I'm not denigrating that work. Beautiful work. Not the same asshole, not the same group. These are assholes. The other ones uh, are different. Uh, but uh, some people like to compare them and say, the Pleiadians. There is no such thing as the the in this. There's a bunch of different groups out there. They're uh, like you have the Mayan Federation, you have a, a planet, a set of planets called Parmavu. They look like uh, natives, but like with a Klingon ridge. They're a type of Tuathan elf mixed with some other elemental type. Uh, kind of look like Worf. Uh, some of them come from Cirrus, some of that genome comes from Cirrus, and uh, Metatron's group was part of it. Uh, also, St. Francis's group was part of that. They were part of a uh, group that oversaw, well, I wouldn't say they were part of that group. Metatron, he was a evil of sin, but uh, Frank, as I call him, or uh, St. Francis, uh, looked like a monk that was an elf that had those same head ridges. So obviously he had some Pleiadian ties and some Syrian ties. He looked over a large garden that had a lot of uh, wildlife on it. Uh, it was a basically like a, a tourist, uh, a tourist uh, getaway for people that were out there in the galaxy. Just like there's a tourist getaway in the Pleiades that I call it the National Park Planet where people can come and go from and camp and whatnot, like we would from a national park. But there is where, uh, uh, oh, I remember her name was, name was, her name was Judanus was the name of that reptilian that she kept claiming she brought me there on romantic trips and stuff like that. I'm not buying it. I think maybe my soul took trips there, but not with her. Uh, I think she was just digging into my Akejic file cabinet. Anyway. Uh, not before I get more sidetracked, just know that Jesker, Judanus, and Narnuth were all Alpha Draco. And some Alpha Draco also have the larger pointed heads to reptilian, but pointed heads. They're kind of a mix between uh, Orion Generation 2 and uh, feral-like reptilian uh, type looks. Some of them even have beards I've seen, so that look like reptilian Vikings, uh, just like I've seen half Viking look, half Draco look before, because those genomes got merged, as I said before. Uh, some German Viking, Germanic Viking, and reptilian type looks. Some of it came from Mars, some of it came uh, from mixing of the genomes, just like uh, Crumb's group. It's part elemental, part Viking giant types. 
Just like there are some elf and Viking merge groups as well. So you have all these with different variations. This group just happens to be merge German, Viking, and uh, reptilian like. Uh, and think about it Aldebaran, called by the Burrell Society. Well, you know, uh, there's a reason that they had a kinship here. So, anyhow, uh, so there are these different Draco groups. And some you know, of you've heard of the big white royals. They look like raptors, but you know, with wings 15 feet tall and they're completely white. Uh, yeah, that is a stage down. I would have to say from this other group, the Princes of the Universe group are their bosses. You would think that the white ones don't have have uh, bosses, but I think there was a misinterpretation as to what white Draco or white Orions were. Like blonde hair, blue eyed, that would be what Hitler would be into. He was also into the white reptilians too, but think of white skin, superior white skin. You know, that's uh, that would fall under blonde hair, blue eyed. One would think that's why Hitler found him beautiful. I even did a channeling, but I saw Hitler finding these beings beautiful. Uh, uh, they were very pretty. They're, to me, they're photoshopped, mind you. But Jesker always showed himself as either a very fierce reptilian with like reddish, green, uh, reddish, uh, uh, orangey, yellowy eyes that would shift. And uh, uh, same thing with Judanus. Uh, she was more of a brown-skinned uh, Drac type. There's these Drac type of uh, of um, reptilians that have uh, that fly in these large, rectangular, uh, cubish, like rectangular vessels. That's another breed of reptilian that's out there. Those have like different space stations out in the galaxy. So there's another breed of of Draco there or offshoot. Uh, Joanna had a vision one time where she was, she had bilocated to a Draco, uh, a Draco uh, space station, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden it just went poof, and she was, uh, she had thrown him into this whirlwind. She just happened to, to see um, who was attacking me at one time, and it was from a far off, distant part of space, and there were these Draco sitting at a council table with, with uh, other reptilians and Nordics. So they were all kind of just sitting at the same council table. And she kind of whirlwinded them and, and really messed their day up a little bit. And it was, this is what she was trying to do in the SSP on the moon. She would be one of those where if she would have this emotional reaction and then something would blow up somewhere like a moon. So uh, she was trained in that enhanced weaponized type of psychic like psionic burst this is also why in other instances uh when she was abducted like in our trip to the bahamas when the military took us to the that line island in the middle of the bermuda triangle they had her drugged uh, we never understood this until recently she also has some werewolf codes in there from way back she also has codes from other lifetimes and other places and expressions like i do where there's there's cat dog slash tool uh, all these that are in there like me so anyhow before i get too far off track just know there are some that kind of ride the line between really lizard and nordic and i wanted to put that uh, uh in the blades show again ran out of room on the princes of the universe one this one still applied and uh the, the blades that seem to be like almost emerging between some of these and and um untumman influence so i just find, i found that fascinating all the histories have been kind of blended in the elder scrolls but i wanted to put this in there because uh also naga i've run into them too like i said in the show but uh this uh all these synchronicities that have popped up recently with this with these snake synchronicities draconian and of course these princes of the universe nordic orions or i should say nordic aldebaran orions very important distinction because uh there's pleiadian uh good guys out there please if you're a channeler please look into this a little closer uh Big difference between Barbara Marciniak's uh, The Pleiadian, Pleiadian Agenda and Bringers of the Dawn and all of those books and uh, uh, Aldebaran, Orion, Nordic. There is a huge difference there. 
So I wanted to make that distinction just in case uh, there was some hate mail that would follow this. I'm not dumping on, on this person at all. So I wanted to make that clear. So I will leave this here, but just know that a lot of these synchronicities have popped up like at our lecture today. Uh, and there was some even interruptions with uh, some people that were supposed to be there that didn't show. And we get, can guess who. Uh, we can guess who participated in that. So, and made that happen. So, it is 10.22 p.m. Saturday, September 10th, 2022. Thank you.